everyone hear me? Great. Doesn't have my notes. Great. Uh, all right. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing uh, with Tom Gilbert at Cornell. How many people know this woman? Anyone? No one. Um, in fact, you do know her. This is, uh, or you've heard of her. Uh, this is Rebecca Erler. She's 36 year old. She's an accountant. Uh, she has two young boys, and you've heard of her in the State of the Union address, uh, in the previous State of the Union address, where President Obama told us, told the nation, the story of Rebecca, uh, how her family was hit by the economy, how her husband's construction business went under, um, how they were forced to move to a different state in order to look for work. Uh, they had to take out several student loans uh, on top of the education they already had in order to attend a local community college to get uh, retraining for a different career. And then uh, how after seven years of hard work, they were able to uh, buy their first house. And of course, the, the reason that Obama told this story is because Rebecca's story is inspiring. It gives us a lot of hope. Um, you, you hear the story, and, and, you, and you walk out feeling good about yourself. But for me, it also brings up a different question, which is, what kept her going? What, what keeps uh, people like, like Rebecca going? You know, if you look at, if you look at Mike's uh, data, for example, and when we know there's more and more millionaires and billionaires than ever, how do people in Rebecca's situation that lose everything keep going day after day? Now, before, before I'll talk about Rebecca's story, I want to take a look at the bigger picture here, which is, it's not just Rebecca's story, it's the story of most people in the United States. Financial inequality has been on the rise in the past 40 years. Uh, for example, here's a graph plotting the median household income versus the top 5%, and, and like you've seen in Mike's data, um, it's been growing and growing steadily. And even if you focus just on the past 15 years, you actually see that in the past 15 years, the median has seen a decline in, in household income. Now, it doesn't matter how much how you carve the data. In the past 30 years, inequality has risen in most developed countries. And for example, in 2012, the top 10 percent took home about half of the national income versus um, a third in 1970. Or if you look at the top 1 percent, they've seen a rise of 86 percent in varied income versus the remaining 99 percent, uh, who've seen only a 6 percent uh, rise. Now, this wouldn't be problematic um, if it was just, OK, they're making more. but. There's a lot of psychological costs to financial inequality. Uh, inequality is associated with things like higher divorce rates, higher bankruptcy rates, uh, diminished well-being and poorer health, like Mike showed us. Uh, longer work hours, longer commutes. People that live in counties that are more unequal have to commute longer uh, to work. And even higher homicide rates. So for example, if you plot the, uh, uh, if you plot the Gini index of different countries, and the homicide rate in those countries, you can see a very positive linear relation where countries like uh, South Africa and Dominican Republic have a high income inequality and also high homicide rates versus countries that have low income inequality like Japan and Denmark have also lower homicide rates. So you would assume with, with, with these associations, I have to say these are all correlations. It doesn't mean that income inequality causes all of these, but it does paint a picture of all the ills that are associated with income inequality. And you would assume that with all these problems, income inequality rising, and all these psychological costs of income inequality, that people will be wild up, that people like Rebecca uh, will be either depressed or in the streets uh, fighting for more equality. But as a whole, Americans don't seem to be too concerned about the income inequality. And, and I have to say, it's not, they're not concerned at all. I think that they are concerned. We've seen. Uh, in recent years, a, a growing concern, but, but as a whole, people are not too concerned. Um, they acknowledge there's a rise in income inequality, but they don't see it as a major problem. This comes up in every poll, in every survey. Um, and when you ask them to rank the, uh, the problems that are facing the United States, income inequality doesn't rank high. So the question is, why aren't people like Rebecca more concerned about income inequality? And it seems, of course, there's a lot of reasons. It's, this is a very complicated psychological phenomenon. But one big reason that, that, uh, that's playing a, a role here is the belief in the dominant ideology, that people are born equal and have an equal chance to succeed. So for example, 
Uh, 70% of Americans believe that the poor have a reasonable chance of escaping poverty, or when you have people think about self-made individuals or read stories about self-made individuals, they, it increases their agreements with things like hard work is rewarded by success, or opportunity exists for anyone to get ahead. But this just pushes the question back, which is, what is social mobility, and, and how do you measure it, and, and how, what, if, what do people think it is? So in this work, uh, sorry, I'll tell you that, that studies in the, in the past have assessed people's general beliefs about opportunities to get ahead in life. Um, so for example, do you agree or disagree with the statement, social mobility is possible, or hard work and effort guarantee success, and so forth. And, and these, these questions are very useful. They give us uh, a very quick and easy way of getting people's general attitudes, but they leave a lot of questions on the table. Uh, I've added an asterisk here because this has been changing, so uh, Michael Krauss has a paper that just came out um, a month ago. Um, there's a paper in Psych Science in the past few weeks that came out, again, also looking at it in a more sophisticated way. Um, and I think this is a great thing, and this is exactly what I've been trying to do, which is answering, answer these questions that are left unanswered. Uh, so, for example, how accurate are people's perceptions of mobility? And how do perceptions of, mobility, of upward mobility compare to perceptions of downward mobility? And then finally, who believes in social mobility? What are, what are the characteristics of people that believe in social mobility? So in, in this study, uh, we had two samples. One sample was a nationally representative sample, uh, Americans of all walks of life. And the second sample, it, it was a sample of convenience from Mechanical Turk. Uh, a little spoiler alert, we get the exact same um, results in both samples. And we asked people to imagine uh, someone born, someone uh, born in, the, in either the poorest or the richest quintile in the United States, and estimate what is the likelihood that they will remain there as an adult or move to the, each of the other quintiles to make things easier for them. And for me, I stole uh, Mike and Dan Ariely's uh, image from their paper in 2011, uh, showing people about income inequality. You can have the graph after I'm done with this paper. Um, showing people what is income quintiles. Um, and this is exactly what we saw. So imagine someone born in the poorest 20%. What is the likelihood that as an adult will remain in the poorest 20% versus rise to the second poorest, the middle uh, 20%, and all the way to the top? And other people estimated downward mobility. So imagine someone born in the richest 20%. What is the likelihood they'll remain there as an adult or drop to each of the four quintiles below it? So let me show you some of the data. I'll walk you through the first uh, slide uh, quite slowly just because it gets a little bit, uh, you need some time to understand it, but then you, it'll go smoothly for the rest of it. So on the left, you'll see the perceived upward mobility. What do people believe are the chances of someone born in the poorest 20% to rise uh, to each of the uh, quintiles as an adult? So for example, we believe that there's about a 30, 35% chance that someone born in the poorest uh, Quintile will stay there as an adult. There's about a 20% chance, they believe there's a 20% chance of them rising to the second poorest or the middle and all the way to rising to the top. Now, what do they think about downward mobility? What do they think are the chances of someone born to the richest 20% will, um, will end as an adult? So, participants believe, there's, our participants believe that there's about 10% chance that you're born in the richest 20% that you will drop to the poorest or the second poorest, about a 12-13% chance of dropping to the middle, uh, dropping to the second uh, richest, or remaining in the richest 20%. Now, having these beliefs, we can compare what are the perceptions of upward social mobility versus downward social mobility. So for example, what do people believe are the likelihood of someone born in the poorest 20% to rise to the middle or uh, higher as an adult versus someone born in the richest 20% drop to the, to the middle or, or below it. And when you think about this, this is what intuitively people refer to as social mobility. What is the likelihood that as an adult you will significantly change your standing in life? Um, and when you compare those, you get a very significant effect where people believe that gaining wealth is more likely than losing it, but upward mobility is more likely than downward mobility. Now another way to look at this data is what do people, what do people believe are the likelihood that you will stay as an adult in, in, the, in the standing that your parents were in, where you were born? Or how sticky are the, are the ends? 
Um, so for example, what is the likelihood that as an adult, if you were born in the poorest 20%, you'll stay there? Versus as an adult, if you were born in the richest 20%, you'll stay there? And again, you find a, you find a, a big difference. People believe that staying in the top 20% is more likely than, than staying in the bottom 20%. But, but wealth is, is stickier than poverty, or, or you can think of it as another way. If people have this belief that being wealthy is, is a permanent state, but being poor is temporary. Now, how accurate are people? So on the left here, you'll see actual mobility rates uh, as uh, estimated by the Pew Mobility Project in 2012. And these are the actual mobility rates in the United States. So someone born in the poorest 20% is uh, about 40, 42% chance of staying there. Another 23, 24% chance of uh, rising to the second poorest, and all the way to rising to the top 20%. Now, on the right, you'll see the data I've already shown you. What is the perceived upward mobility? What do people believe are these, these rates? So, and, and now when, when we have, when we have the, the actual mobility rates versus the perceived mobility, we can, we can compare them and see are people accurate. And obviously, as you can see, they aren't. Um, so for example, compare the likelihood that someone is actually someone that's born in the poorest 20% will rise to the middle or higher versus the perceived uh, likelihood. And yes, people overestimate upward mobility. How do we do with downward mobility? On the left here, you'll see the actual downward mobility rates, again, uh, from the Pew Mobility Project. Um, so someone born in the richest 20% has about 12% uh, chance, I think, to um, drop to the, to the poorest 20%, all the way to remaining in the top versus the perceived, the data you've already seen. And again, we can compare the differences here. Uh, what is the likelihood that someone born in the richest 20% will stay there versus the perceived likelihood of that happening? Um, and again, these are uh, significant data, and, and like Mike alluded, uh, when, you, when you run studies with 1,500 participants per condition, uh, a lot of things are significant, but this replicates when you, when you run it uh, with smaller samples, um, and the effect size remains the same. So it's not just something about the, the sample size. People are overestimating upward mobility and underestimating downward mobility. So, I guess the question is why is upward mobility uh, perceived as more likely than downward mobility? And, and there are three reasons, I, there might be more, there are three reasons that uh, I've been thinking about. One is the American dream, right? We hear a lot about it, we, we read a lot about it. Um, in the media, you'll see, you'll, you'll see a, lot of, a lot more stories about people making it big. Uh, and, and every now and then you do hear of someone who, who experienced uh, some fall, but Mostly that doesn't happen. So we hear a lot about the American dream, but not so much about the American nightmare. Um, the second reason is this general cognitive bias that, um, that Tom and I have been working on, uh, where we show that this is not specific just to the financial domain. Uh, but people believe that rising in rankings, uh, like sports, is more likely than dropping in rankings. Um, but finally, I want to focus on system justification. Uh, that people believe in social mobility because it justifies uh, it justifies the system that they live under. So, just a very short uh, uh, recap about system justification theory. If people have this need to see their, their system is fair and just. If you can't, if you, if you live under a system and you can't really change it, then you're you have this motivation uh, to perceive it as a fair system. Because living under a system that's unfair or unjust is threatening, and it often leads to um, to anxiety. So you want to make make. Uh, want to change that anxiety, reduce that anxiety. So what is more justifiable than a system that's mobile, but you don't have any obstacles to uh, your success? So it's also been argued that the core ideology of political conservatism is about system justification. It's about the status quo being right and correct. So we hypothesize that conservatives should see the system as more mobile than liberal. Now in the Mechanical Turk study, I was able to ask other than just the perceptions of mobility, but also what are your political attitudes from extremely liberal to extremely conservative. Um, here on the left you'll see that extremely conservatives believe there's much more mobility, I don't know if you can see this, I can, um, than, than extremely liberals. The more, uh, the more liberal that they were, the, the less they believed in mobility. And I guess the question is, who's more accurate? So again, here you'll see on the left, the actual upward mobility rates that you've already seen. 
Uh, this is, uh, if you carve the data by liberals versus conservatives, this is liberals' perceptions of mobility. I mean, we're dead on. We're, uh, that's basically liberal wisdom of the crowds. Um, but how do conservatives see upward mobility? As you can see, conservatives overestimate upward mobility. Um, but how do they do with downward mobility? So on the left, you'll see the actual downward mobility rates. These are data you've already seen again. And now it seems that liberals are underestimating downward mobility, where conservatives are closer to uh, the real estimate. Another tenet of, of system justification is that people, uh, the more people feel dependent on a given system, the more they're motivi motivated to justify it. Um, if the system controls all your life, it controls every aspect of your life, then you're more likely to feel like, okay, I need this system to be fair and just. Um, so there's a lot of factors that increase your dependence on the system, uh, and they should also increase uh, your beliefs in, in social mobility. So income or, or SES, uh, membership in minority or ethnic <laughs> or racial groups, and education. I'll show you just the data for income, um, but as you can see, the higher, the more, this is in the representative sample, so we get people from all, um, all incomes, and the more people were, uh, the higher income, the less people believed in mobility. The lower the income they had, the more they believed in social mobility. And you can carve it up by people in the, in the bottom quintile versus the top quintile. Um, and everyone believes there's more upward mobility than downward mobility. And again, I told you, there's, there's the American dream going on here, there's a general cognitive bias going on here. But what's important is that people that are lower, lower in income, lower in socioeconomic status, Believers much more upward and much more downward mobility. They just perceive the system as, as more fair because if not, then how do they get by in every day? So to summarize, the, how you see mobility depends on how mobility is framed. If we talk about upward mobility versus downward mobility. And Americans overestimate upward mobility and, and underestimate downward mobility. I don't think this is only Americans. I think this is a general thing and uh, it'd be interesting to um, to get cross-cultural data. And then finally, with conservatives overestimate upward mobility and liberals underestimate it, I mean, the people who are most dependent on the system are most likely to perceive the system as mobile. So I've only talked about this box, the mobility, the perception of mobility. In the future, it would be interesting questions to look at what leads to perceptions of mobility. What are the antecedents of, of uh, how we come up with these perceptions of mobility, and then also, what are the consequences of seeing uh, the system as mobile? So this is uh, a statement by uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, saying that Americans have tolerated a little more inequality for the sake of a more dynamic and a more adaptable economy. A commitment to equality of opportunity and to upward mobility. The idea that no matter how poor you started, if you're willing to work hard, you can make it too. And that's the American dream. And this gives people hope. And, and it gives them a reason to keep going. And sometimes it works. It worked for Rebecca Erler, who after seven years was able to buy a house. But it doesn't work for everyone. And I think that it's, it's time that we start talking not just about mobility, but also about the lack of mobility. And it's time that we start talking not just about upward mobility, but also about downward mobility. And, and of course, as psychologists, we don't have all the answers. Right? But, but we, we do have one valuable thing that a lot of other fields don't, and the, we have the tools to, to examine what people believe in. Right? We have the tool to examine what people think about. And, and most specifically, we have the tools to examine what people think about when they think about social mobility. So thank you very much. <laughs>